So welcome to this episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. I'm here with Ash Nalawala, who is based in Melbourne. He's an SEO consultant uh, and a good friend of mine. We've, we've known each other for quite a few years from our exploits on both Webmaster World, where I think you you were a moderator and I used to post quite a lot, uh, and also from PubCon. We were just right up in the green room. We were just talking a little bit about our uh, days at PubCon. So Ash, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me. I'd love to tell you about my mistakes and some of outtakes and some of those that were not mistakes in hindsight. So. For the benefits of those joining in who, who maybe don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about where you're from and how did you end up getting to Melbourne? Yeah, I was born in uh, Bombay, India, which is now known as uh, Mumbai. And I went to an English medium school, which uh, tends to be um, how it is for middle class um, families that are aspiring to uh, get a job because office jobs uh, in those days um, were entirely in English. So most people um, studied entirely in English and that's my school background. But um, I, I was okay in high school. I wouldn't say um, I was in the top five. In, my, in terms of my final results in school, I did well for the uh, people who went into the commerce stream. That sort of sets a background to making a bad decision. I hung out with the wrong kids. They were not bad kids. They were simply the wrong kids. They were extremely wealthy, and I was just dazzled by their wealth. So I spent a lot of time in their homes instead of staying in my house and doing my homework. And little by little, I started not doing so well in maths. And the outcome of that was at a certain stage, which in the Indian or the Bombay system was called the eighth standard, which is the eighth year of schooling. And I was told, sorry, you can't take higher maths. So I never did calculus, trigonometry, and whatever else they were doing, which meant I could not do science, whereas I was interested in science. And later on, one of my hobbies was amateur radio, which involves electronics and physics and all that. So in a way, not doing science also meant I couldn't do medicine. Therefore, my only choice was to do commerce, which practically for most people means doing accounting. Now, I can't even, balance, the, I can't even balance a checkbook, so that's about the extent of <laughs> I finance. One of my other hobbies was writing to famous people. Not too many of them, but at least one of them. A late uncle of mine was the personal photographer of Lord Mountbatten whom many will know, at least in the UK, that he was a member of the royal family, um, I think the Queen's uncle, I believe, and he was the last viceroy and then governor general of India. So my uncle was his photographer. And my uncle died before I was born, and I wrote to him saying, oh, I've found these old photos. Uh, a lot of them are duplicates. Would you like to have them? So he replied and said, oh, yes, I'll, I'd love them from my archives. And that started an occasional conversation once a year, twice a year type of letters. In those days, there was no email. So you had and Lord Mountbatten as a pen pal. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And after I finished my university education, I he asked, how did I go? And I said, oh, yeah, that, that was fine. It's all okay. I passed and all that. But I'm really a bit annoyed at the moment because this New Zealand government just rejected my application for a working holiday visa. And the reason for that is I wanted to meet my pen pal who I'd become very fond of and I thought maybe we might get married one day or something. So suddenly <laughs> all my years of corresponding with this girl were just destroyed by one letter. No, uh, this was a girl in New Zealand. Gotcha. And to cut a very long story short, because it is quite a story, he wrote to the Governor General of New Zealand, chatted about their time together on the Britannia, which was the Royal Yacht, and with the Queen as well. She was around somewhere. And chatted about their times on the yacht and said, oh, by the way, can you help this person who's trying to get to New Zealand and has stuck some red tape? And again, jumping several other celebrities in the chain, I got my visa. That's basically how I ended up in New Zealand. This just goes to show it's not always like the process. Sometimes it's who you know that can open doors for you. Yeah, so I'm putting all of this in yet another book. It may not be for the public, but I'm writing a book for my grandchildren called Accidental, sorry, Fortunate Connections. Because 
most people go through life and their lives take a random turn. And it's all because of someone you've met. I know that I've met people at these PubCon conferences and they've helped me uh, shift in a slightly different direction. They've made introductions to me. Not surprisingly, my life has been like that even before my SEO career. So I ended up in New Zealand, met my wife there, and we wanted to buy a house in Auckland. And Auckland is a very expensive city, even compared to Australia. And her parents lived there, and so we thought we'd do what lots of Kiwis have done, which is to go to Australia for a few years, save up for a deposit, and go back. Now, the only thing that didn't um, pan out was I couldn't get a job in um, Australia. I didn't get a single interview for three months, which was absolutely new to me because in New Zealand, I had two jobs. In both cases, I literally walked off the street and I walked out with a job. It didn't happen in Australia. What did happen is there was an ad from the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, which we also call the RAF, but has an extra A in it. And they gave me a salary which was four times that of my last New Zealand salary. And so you can't beat a fourfold increase in income. So we just stayed. And then eventually our entire family of six brothers and sisters joined her. And her parents also came to Australia to other parts of the country. But suddenly home for her had shifted to Australia. So we never went back to New Zealand. Cool. Basically, that's when some of my decisions come into play. Like, why did we move to Perth in Australia. So um, isn't that the skincare can isn't Perth the skincare cancer capital of the world almost? I think everyone I know has been in lived at some point in time in Perth has ended up with skin cancer. I don't know why, but okay. it's a very sunny city. Uh, it's a beautiful place on the Indian Ocean side of Australia. Now my parents were in Bombay. Uh, Leslie's parents were in Auckland. So I said on the map, Perth is halfway. Let's go there. And that was a bad choice in the sense that there were fewer jobs in Perth and therefore it took a long time. And there were many reasons why I was getting an interview, um, one of which was my name, which sounds Aboriginal, plus I'm Indian, plus the fact that Australia had a white Australia policy till just seven years before that. And one recruiter even suggested I anglicize my name to John Smith or something like that, which obviously I didn't. But anyway, the RAF was really good for me. I saw the world literally. I went around the world. I was only there for eight years. But I developed an interest in computers because anyone who grew up uh, in the 60s, 70s saw the beginning of computers. And I built, I had to build my first Z80 based microbe computer because that's all I could afford. And it only came in kit. Um, before that, I was very keen on radio listening. I hadn't quite gone into amateur radio, which I did later on in New Zealand. But, and that goes back to my wish to do something with electronics. So, I, having built this computer, I started learning about bits and bytes and hexadecimal. And as you can appreciate, some of these concepts are still useful today when you're talk, looking at hex uh, numbers for graphics, for example. We use all kinds of overlapping terminology and units of measurement. So I was quite lucky that I was interested in computers. Now, inside the RAF, I tried very hard to get jobs where I could put my hands on a keyboard. And eventually Canberra, which is where our headquarters is, they got fed up of me and they said, look, we've tried to help you with computers as much as we can, because this is still the mid 80s. There weren't that many computers in the workforce except for mainframes and PCs had just started appearing on people's desktops, except not mine. And luckily for me, I was posted uh, to a public publishing unit. And the role of that unit was to maintain the technical manuals of the aircraft. And it was just maintenance because aircraft were either British or they were American. And they came with manuals, but sometimes they had to be modified locally. And that's all the unit did, but it was all done with electric typewriters. And I was lucky that I could introduce desktop publishing. It's funny, when, when you talk to children of today, 
And I always remember we used to have what we called it tip X, like the white stuff that you would put on when you typed the wrong letter and you would have to do it. And then on some electric type, type, typewriters, it would have like that. You could backspace it. It would put the tip X on itself and it really yeah, evolved. Yeah. And again, I think the evolution of that technology, again, has been fascinating. The printing side of things has really been fascinating the, the way it's evolved so much. Yes, I was lucky to be sent to the Royal New Zealand Air Force to study their production methods. They were slightly ahead of us, except that they had these 12-inch optical discs. I don't know if they had a name other than optical discs, but uh, that was state-of-the-art, the storage. They were bigger than DVDs, and they used some proprietary publishing system, which we didn't get. We just went with the standard Ventura publisher, which was competing with PageMaker, which were the two big desktop publishing pools of the days. Yes. I did well, and the Air Force said, I think we need to promote you, send you to Staff College, and then send you to the real Air Force up north. And you know, I, I thought the real Air Force meant no computers. And I told them that I was leaving. And so I was very lucky that um, I had a my civilian boss was ex RAF, um, and um, he gave me four months to to resign because, as an officer, I had to give three months' notice. But I said, "Oh, can I ask for four months' notice if so I can complete a full anniversary?" And he said, yeah, "You're going to get some equipment, publishing a special publishing workstation called Zyvision that was still on the high seas. The whole of Unisys, which is the company that I joined." It's a big computer company. Now maybe it's not so big. It's still around somewhere. He used this proprietary workstation with 8-inch floppy disks. Now, luckily, I never had to touch one of those floppy disks because they had a fantastic, gigantic 500-megabyte hard drive. And that was more than I needed. And we could transmit the files. We, we would save them on tape, and we'd ship the tape to somewhere in Michigan, where Unisys had a production facility. So I worked in a software development center which had been created with a five-year license on the basis that if we exported anything from there, which was just software to America or anywhere else, then Unisys could import hardware without paying duty, but only for five years. So at the end of five years, they just shut down and let us go. And that's really when um, I had to really start looking for work. And I found that an earlier bad decision was doing an accounting degree, joining the Air Force basically meant that I'd given up 14 years of my working life and I was competing with marketers because I wanted to get into marketing. And I was working, competing against people who had been doing marketing for 14 years, like me. And this is obviously so, tradi uh, traditional marketing, so traditional marketing, sort of yeah, TV, yeah. radio, print, that type of thing. So I was lucky again within Unisys that I got pushed from editing. I was a senior editor there, worked with 14 technical writers. Um, then I became a product manager, and then I became a software release manager. So I wore a few hats, but I was beginning to get the hang of writing in marketing. So my next job with Hayes, the modem people, the CEO was the famous Dennis Hayes, who's still one of my Facebook connections. I had met Dennis at a Comdex because I was connected with computer user groups in a big way for over 20 years uh, as my volunteer duty. I helped the Melbourne PC user group become the biggest in the world. I started their internet service in my living room. And Dennis Hayes donated I forget how many, but something like 48 modems. And they were expensive. In Australian dollars, they were expensive to buy. So that was a huge gift that he gave. And obviously, mo mo modems, for those of, again, of a certain age, like you and I, we, we obviously grew up using modems as our means of access to get access to the internet on dial-up. It cost, you have to pay by the minute for the kind of usage. I was regularly running up 12, 1,400 pound a quarter phone bills by, because the modems were really slow and it took forever to download anything, right? So if you wanted to download an image, it would take, you'd see it coming in one line at a time, and it would just take absolutely forever. But at the same time, the modem was the traditional means of connecting people for, to each other in, in different countries without having to have the really expensive relay mechanism, so. 
yeah, I started my with the first modem of 300 uh, bits per second, also known as 300 baud. And this is before I started at Hayes. And I used to work with, not work, but uh, play with other people's bulletin boards. Uh, for a little while, I had my own Fidonet node. Uh, I had no users. It was just for my own benefit. But I also had a Waffle BBS. Now, that software relied on the Unix UUCP protocol, which is Unix to Unix copy, which is a method of how two Unix machines would, would talk to each other and swap files or data. And that was the prototype on which I started my club's computer service for members. Uh, and that eventually it had 7,000 subscribers and they made a ton of money. Today they own a million dollar um, entire half floor of a commercial building. So they made lots of money. Now they're down to about 2,000 members and they're probably still the biggest in the world because hardly anyone joins computer clubs anymore. And that's another relic of the past. So it's funny, like I, I, I always remember one of my very early PPC clients. He was like a, a kind of, he, he knew computer language, programming languages that was going to be mission critical for when we had like the Y2K, year 2000. So like basically the whole world was due to stop at the stroke of midnight on the 31st of December, 1999, because all the computers had been just set up to go from double digits. So when it went from 99 to zero, everything was going to come grinding to a halt, right? So he was basically making an absolute fortune because he was one of the few people who actually knew how to write the code that a lot of these original kind of legacy systems that they used in banking and air traffic control and everything, that's the, the language that it was all written in. Then he was one of the experts in it. And he was literally just sitting around waiting to be called upon. And when it all clicked to midnight, nothing happened, nothing changed. And all of a sudden it's like, great. So his expertise was not needed, but it was good that he had it. And he, cut, he dined out on it for quite some time. Yeah, so a few years went by and I had two or three other employers in between. But I joined Macromedia, which anyone in the web industry would know from the early 2000s as the company that made um, a, a lot of um, software, uh, including, correct, um, yeah, I've forgotten some of the names, but um, it was known as the MX suite. MX was the, I was very lucky that I didn't have to pay money at staff prices. I could purchase one for 25 US dollars, the whole thing, which cost maybe $1,500 or something. But I could also uh, play with other software um, that was in our cupboard for <laughs> giving away as a freebie to customers. So I took some of those freebies myself, so did all the other staff. And that was really fun time because as a CRM manager, I had a huge successful campaign where we hired a call center that could speak five or six languages of Asia. And because my database covered Asia, they started calling all these uh, people in the database. Uh, these were people who had downloaded the trial versions of software and tried to upsell them. Now, we collected $8 million worth of leads and I was on top of the world. I thought, my God, this is amazing. And suddenly, we were told the company is moving to Singapore. We are not taking staff with us. So goodbye. So from that big high, um, I was left wondering, now what can I do? So I built this domain called crm911.com, which is my email address, nothing else. Uh, it was supposed to be a CRM consultancy. And I, this is when I applied my SEO knowledge that I'd been collecting along the way, and I applied it. And I ranked number one for that phrase, CRM consultant, for a good five to 10 years. I uh, can't remember for how long. Until Google started becoming unreasonable, they, yeah, I, it's really rude of them. They started expecting actual content, not just keywords. And because I wasn't actually, I, there was no contact form on that. People who knew that it was my site said, but how can we reach you? You don't have a phone number on it. You don't have a form. I said, yeah, that's okay, because... I've got to tell you, Ash, I that sounds like a it. really bad decision. You could have completely cleaned up in lead generation for basically CRM, people that needed CRM yeah. assistance. 
even if you didn't do the work yeah, yourself, yeah. you could have sold those leads on to other people without a doubt. I thought I had the secret of lead generation. I, I started a book and I think I wrote about 60 pages and, and then SEO just swept me away because I was talking to an American in a product manager's group, um, can't remember the platform, whether it was LinkedIn or some earlier version of that. But I was just telling him about the story and he said, oh, you do SEO, do you? My client needs someone who knows SEO. It's this new thing. So yeah, I can help them. So that happened to be a company called Ring Central, which in those days was a family-owned business started by a Russian and a Ukrainian. And I think they had five or six people in San Mateo and maybe an unknown number in St. Petersburg. And their software, especially their fax software, was in almost every laptop sold in those days. So if you had an HP or a Dell laptop, um, it came with a DVD of their software. So it, everyone knew the brand, but their business was 1-800-NUMBERS. It's like the, the AOL disc that used to appear on every single magazine that kind of went out the shop. Every single, yeah, shop. Yeah. I, again, at one point in time, I looked in my front room and I thought, I must have about 50 AOL installation discs because they, every single computer magazine I bought had an AOL disc on the cover of it in a plastic bag. And basically they, they were trying to acquire mass users by providing this software. I think, I'm sure I read a statistic that there are still millions of people in America that still have dial up their ISP is AOL and they still use their AOL email address, which again, I think is amazing. I mean, AOL used to be yeah, yeah. synonymous with people with like, and I'm, I want to try and choose my words carefully here, but no brains, but lots of money because they couldn't work out how to figure out Google. They couldn't work out how to figure out a new ISP. So they stuck with AOL and really slow internet because that's all they needed to occasionally go and make a purchase online. But again, yeah, those, those, it's just amazing how many people yeah, yeah. still have it. Yeah, those people were probably on CompuServe. I used to be in a sysop for Hayes in the CompuServe days, which is another system, but that's going off track. So anyway, I did the SEO for um, Rick Central, thinking that's just a short assignment. And that's when I made a bad decision. Uh, to get that contract, I said I work for 25 US dollars an hour, which is really low. And they just jumped on it and they took me on. And because I did a good job uh, with SEO, they said, oh, can you look at our PPC? I said, hang on, I'm a CRM consultant. I, I'm, I've helped you out, but I'm not a PPC guy. They said, oh, here's the login. Just take a look. It's easy. And in those days, it wasn't just Google AdWords, as Google Ads used to be known. There were at least five or six others with penny clicks. I can't remember the names of those other systems. So we, you had go to uh, find what yes, go, yes. go to became, became overture, find what merged. I think they, they got, they acquired e-spotting. There was, I'm trying to think what others were there were. Look, look, look smart. Look smart. Yeah. Um, smart. Yeah. And I think look smart. Did, like, 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 yeah. And, and look smart did really well because they'd negotiated a really sweet deal with MSN. So MSN results was the lion's share of look smarts traffic. And here in the UK, it was like BT. So BT was the kind of the line share of Look Smart's traffic here in the UK. Yeah. And again, yes. it, was, it was phenomenal. I think a lot of people really didn't understand the, the value of how, how great Look Smart was. But yeah. So the outcome of that was I was at $25 an hour for three years. And I wasn't working full time. I forget how many hours I was working, but um, I kept thinking about my CRM consultancy, but it was the end of the dot com boom. And no one was installing new CRM systems. So I thought, hang on, let's just stick to this SEO stuff. At least someone's paying me money. I may not get any CRM customers. So th that is why I never <laughs> worked as a consultant in CRM. I was getting a little anxious about my income because I had a fam young family and a mortgage to support. And so when I saw an advertised job for a SEO manager, at an agency, I grabbed it. So that was a company called Melbourne IT, which is one of the larger registrars in this part of the world. And I completely turned it around. It, I didn't know at the time that they were going to shut it down, but I gave them a tremendous boost. And I, I think they're still around under a different name perhaps, but they've been selling SEO ever since. So uh, I can think at around this point, okay, I did the right thing by coming to Australia. So otherwise I wouldn't be in all these companies and 
met all these people and who knows, I could have ended up as an accountant. It's a horrible thought. So I then decided that I wasn't cut out to be a solo operator. When you go from a solo consultancy to a salary job and you think, okay, a salary job may not make you rich, but at least it's more or less guaranteed income from day to day. And for most of my career, I've stayed inside companies as an in-house person rather than as an agency. So again, just for the benefits of those people listening in or watching, the challenge. So again, I, I know a lot of people who are amazing at doing SEO, but are absolutely appalling at running a business, right? And they are absolutely the sort of people, I'm not saying that you fit into that category at all, Ash, right? But there are a lot of people that they set up their own business, right? They're good at SEO, lousy at running businesses. So they're lousy at collecting money, lousy at administration, lousy at customer service. And they end up either going out of business because they just don't know how to run a business. And they are much, much better suited to working in-house for either small businesses or if they have a kind of particular uh, specialism, maybe working for a, a bigger company, maybe enterprise level sort of SEO. Um, so yeah, if you are trying to get into the industry, maybe go down that path. Not, not like everyone thinks running your own business is all glamour and glitz and everything else. And it's really not. There's an awful lot of challenges. I always said to somebody that the, the thing with running your own business is every single day you wake up and you're unemployed. Every single day you've got to go out and hustle because you've got nothing to fall back on other than your own kind of output, right? You've got nobody else to fall back on, right? So uh, it's just something if, if you are trying to, go career path, career decision. Should I go in-house or should I go set up my own business, right? Setting up your own business is a lot harder than maybe uh, you, you might think it might be at the beginning. Sorry, Ash. My, my accountant, who was one of my college classmates who happened to also move to Melbourne, was talking to me about starting my own business. And he said, Ash, you will not succeed in business because you're too honest. I've thought about those words many times because I've observed other friends who tried to look for loopholes everywhere, trying to save a buck here and there with taxes or not declaring income and so on. And that wasn't me. In the SEO business, if a customer asks you, can you get me a top 10 ranking or number one? You can't say yes to everyone. In fact, at Melbourne IT, I remember rejecting a customer who wanted to rank number one in the whole world for the word cheese, one word, cheese. And this is back in the mid 2000s. And even back then I said, no, that's not possible. I didn't know some of the lingo that I know today, like search intent, that concept didn't exist back then, but people search for a word with some intent behind it. There might be a school kid researching cheese. They may not necessarily want to buy cheese or they may not want to buy your kind of cheese. It's all right. one, so, one word is, the context can be completely different. Even, again, even if the word is not something as simple as you said, take a word like pizza, right? Again, the word pizza, right? Depending on somebody's device they're on, the location they're in, the time of the day of the week can dictate whether they're looking to make it, whether they're looking to have pictures of it, whether they're looking to get it delivered, whether they're looking for a restaurant, right? So many different contexts of that can apply to that same term, right? Which is, again, I think that's one of the reasons why things like AI and, and, and everything uh, is so beneficial because... Google have the data to be able to say they understand better the context of what that person has done up to the point that they type cheese into the search bar, right? They've done 25 other searches prior to that search for the word cheese, and they're all looking for recipes. Then they know that when somebody types in cheese, they should be offering up suggestions for recipes rather than for restaurants or for that type of thing. So, Exactly. So at the agency at Melbourne IT, which is a domain name register, but I was in a part of it, which was an SEO PPC agency. We had a customer who was a friend of the my manager, but his website was entirely Flash. And the Flash websites, for those um, who don't know, um, has no HTML in it. It's simply one executable file. There are no pages. You can't turn pages. The whole thing is just one um, container. So you cannot apply standard SEO techniques to it, like different um, titles for different pages. You can't do any of that. I said to my boss, oh, we can't accept this guy because it's a flash site. And he says, no, he's my friend. I promised him that we can help him. So you do whatever you have to do, uh, just help him. So I spoke to my uh, in-house developer and she said, oh, the only way to do it is to take some screenshots of the graphics and then write 
whole thing up as HTML and then use those graphics. Um, so it looks the same. And that was one of the requirements. It had to look the same as the existing site. So she did it with a lot of complaining. And when she delivered it, yes, it worked perfectly. She literally stood up, turned around and just walked out the door. She was never seen again. So it's a decision. I wasn't in a position to make the decision. My boss had made the decision to deliver. So he lost an employee. And I guess we were in trouble for a few weeks till we could hire someone quickly to replace her because there's only one person in-house to do all the technical work. So I was a little more brutal uh, with rejecting, especially after that manager left the company and then I had a different manager. I had a little more say in whom I was rejecting. And, and one day, one of the salespeople almost punched me uh, for <laughs> refusing one of his uh, sales. So we ended up in front of our HR. Things cooled down, but he never was the same again. Then I <clears throat> joined the Yellow Pages, which was my large company experience for the first time. They're, they're, they were quite huge in those days. Back in the day, and they were like two fat volumes for Melbourne's. Um, and the white pages were also, uh, it was a pretty fat book as well. Uh, that was always now, one, of, one, of my, my, one of my claims to fame. That, that the, it was always my desire. I wanted to rip a yellow pages in half with my hands. <laughs> and I think the very last yellow pages that ever got delivered to my house before we just decided that, again, I don't know if it was we stopped it or they stopped it. It came through and it was like really thin and I got this yellow pages and I tore it in half and I'm like, great, I've torn the yellow pages in half. Well, there used to be a trick in those days. I never tried it, but they said if you put it in a very low temperature oven for a day, it dries it out completely and it just crumbles. When you try to rip a fat book apart, it, you can do it. And yeah, that was always my other story. So with, in the same way that the yellow pages was alphabetical, so you start with the companies beginning with the letter A. So you'd have AAA, whatever it would be, aardvark this, and so on and so on. It was the same thing with like directories for SEO, right? So you had the Yahoo directory, the Demos directory, you had the categories, and then in the category, everything would be done alphabetical. I remember sitting down with my wife and some friends, mulling over what to call the company. And we and I was explaining, it's got to be, it's got to start with an A. And I ended up on the name of the company was called Web Diversity which starts with a W, right? And I'm thinking, what am I doing? Right? And I think it was, that was the decision that I made. At that point, I knew I was never going to be a good SEO. So at that point in time, I decided that my future really lied in paid media, and I've never really looked back. That's been my kind of my bag ever since. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I learned a lot about Agile because it was new at the time. In those days, if you've seen Agile environments, you have a daily stand-up, but in those days, so you were given a ball and you toss the ball to a random person and they gave their um, update for the day, and then they tossed it to someone else. And similarly, the tasks that were written up as cards, index cards that you physically stuck on a notice board, and you could move them around with magnets or whatever. Today, Jira is entirely electronic. In my last job until last September, our stand-ups were international. We had developers in other countries, and it was all done on Zoom. So things have moved a lot, but that was my first exposure. And I also encountered this situation where the Scrum Master one day said, we can't do your SEO job unless you explain in terms of sales dollars whether your request will make more money than this other feature that has been requested. I went to my boss and said, how do you quantify a change in the title tag. How much money is that going to make us? I can't give a number. So you begin to strike these blockages in larger companies, and that's where SEO is different, where you can't assume that your task will be done tomorrow or whether it'll ever get that. There are SEO tasks on backlogs going back two or three years. Everywhere I've been. Yeah, because so, commercial viability is almost always going to supersede whatever else like matters, right? So it doesn't matter how much you think it's important, right? The, co the commercial side of things. And that's always been like one of the challenges. I know, I, th I think when I watched some of your previous videos with, that you've done on podcasts with other people, like there was a not so much a complaint, but it was like you made a comment about most of the money goes into PPC rather than into SEO. And I think the part of the reason for that is PPC is typically, or again, it used to be historically, it was much more quantifiable. So you could say, I spend $1,000, I make $10,000, right? Whereas with SEO, you can go, 
I might spend $1,000 today. I have no idea. I might make $100,000, but it might be 18 months down the line. And I think sometimes, again, I think when you look at certainly with publicly traded companies, that's one of the challenges that I think your alphabets and meta and all the other companies that kind of trade, digital marketing companies that trade on the, the sort of stock exchange, their number one objective is to satisfy their shareholders' value, right? So everything else is almost like it's insignificant. They talk about, we want to develop this, we want to develop this. If they don't satisfy the shareholders, those shareholders can put them out of business. And so many big companies that you talked about back in the day, they're gone now because shareholders basically drove them out of town, right? Basically said, you are no longer a viable business proposition, you are done. And that that's the thing that kind of bothers me the most. Like I used to work with Google in the pre-IPO days and they were a fantastic company to work with. They were so cooperative. They listened to people. They would take advice from people. They would invite us to come along and give feedback with engineers and we'd sit and sh shoot, shoot things around a bit and they would come up with some suggestions and they would implement a lot of those suggestions. Whereas now, if you look at the way agencies, people like me who run agencies, are treated by Meta, by by Google, right? It's, it's appalling the way they treat uh, agency partners. They just, again, we're, they use the word partner, but we are not partners at all. There's no partner relationship whatsoever between the majority of the people who call themselves Google partners or Meta partners or whatever. Uh, and there's just no correlation between that particular relationship being a partnership, right? Because partnerships like involve a bit of two-way and there's absolutely no two-way at all. So I'm going to get off my soapbox then. Yeah, yeah so uh, I'll talk um, later about um, my third book where I tackle this specific problem where the C-suite doesn't pay enough attention to SEO, whereas they might approve a huge sum of money for PPC. And I've known, I'd say, at least 20 founders of startups who have all refused to do any SEO. They said, oh, we'll spend it on PPC. And someone told me recently that many venture capitalists tell their um, clients to whom they've given money to spend it on PPC. That's why some of them reject SEO completely and some just don't have enough faith in it. Now, I'm not going to change any of that because that's how things are. and We have to work around that. Now, I had some successes, and major successes in SEO, and they all came because if you do a good job once, you get referred. So at, at the yellow pages, I gave them moderate uh, success, 18% improvement, which was huge uh, when you look at the numbers. But then I was taken by my manager to his next job as a consultant at a very fat rate. Uh, and it was a huge bank, one of our top four banks. And I uh, doubled their organic traffic in eight months. And I wasn't getting them out of a penalty or anything, any problem of any kind, but they were going through a CMS migration, which was an old IBM WCM, which I think was a web sphere content management system, which was horrible for SEO. So it's just as well, but I happened to be called in at that time and I eventually almost tripled their traffic in two and a half years because I did some work there for two years and I went elsewhere, then I came back for another six months. By this time, they tripled their traffic. So if you listen to your advisors, and it's usually an external person because in-house people are never experts. Uh, only external people can be experts. So my best success was as a consultant to a large company. So the good decisions, bad decisions are made by your clients in how they treat consultants versus in-house people. Now you said something earlier about um, uh, in-house uh, SEOs who are not necessarily seen by third parties as experts. Now, I don't do a daily uh, podcast or I don't speak at every conference. Um, because I'm working every day. So I get my expertise by just working every day. So Ash, I've got, I've got to ask you the question. Why are you working at all? Like, why aren't you enjoying your retirement and like spending time with your children and your grandchildren instead of working? Why, why are you still I'm, working? I'm passionate about SEO because I know it works. Having delivered success, especially to the bank, if you listen to people who know what they're on about, it really gives you a lot of revenue. I can't talk about what specific project I did for that bank, but there was a specific product that they were focusing on. And they made a ton of money um, at the end of that quarter. 
that's what kept me going for two years with them. But when you're paid a fantastic four-digit figure a day, um, even their money <laughs> runs out. So I couldn't just keep it going indefinitely. And I had to take a more realistic salary as an in-house person at the next place. I started SEO at the age of 48. Which is late, uh, right? That's like really late. Yeah, people who joined us back in the early 2000s, they were in their 20s, sometimes younger than that. So today they're still in their 40s, but I'm 71. And in my mind, I'm still in my 40s because I started with them, hung out with them online. And I have to keep reminding myself that, hey, I tend to go to the doctor more often these days, so my body is beginning to change. And it's not for the better. Ash, I want to try and wind, thing for, wind things forward. So I, I know that obviously you, again, very checkered career, loved, again, loved all of the history of where you started, where you are now. I want to try and bring things forward to, to exactly where you are now. So you've obviously written, you wrote a book, Accidental, is it Accidental SEO Manager? Yeah. yeah. Accidental SEO Manager in 2022, and it's the first of a trilogy, right? So there's going to be three books in the series. So what made you, I, I'm curious to know, one, what made you decide to write a book? And two, what was the process that you used for getting published and, and everything else? I'm I'm because again, I, I've got a lot of my SEO friends, people like Bill Hunt and so on, they've all written books, right? And to me, I struggle to read a book. I can't even imagine the effort it must take to write a book. So I'm curious to know what's your kind of motivation for wanting to do it and also what your process for kind of publishing the book was. Any book, especially nonfiction books today, don't sell many copies. Um, I think my first book has sold maybe three or 400 copies. Most of them were online. I can't count the free readers because Amazon has this thing called Kindle Unlimited, where you pay a monthly subscription and you can read as many books as you want for free. I don't see those numbers. I get a few pennies for every page that they read, but I can't get a count of how many times uh, someone's read the entire book. But let's say the print and Kindle versions barely sold 500. And that's trivial. So you never write books for the intrinsic revenue that you get from the books. You do it to open doors. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't know what the money side of it looks like, but if you look at the amount of effort that you put in to get to the point where you wrote the end on your first book to 500 copies of the book, or however, again, Kindle Unlimited, who knows? But uh, again, and there's nothing to say if it's, because I, I think it's only available in paperback, in, in certainly when I looked on the Amazon. The second edition is only in paperback because that's one of the other hazards. My book was pirated and sold on Amazon for more than a year. I just discovered that accidentally. Who thought? Who would have thought that somebody would have done so, something as, as dirty as stealing a, a book for, for SEO? They changed the title. That's why I never found it. Until I decided to search for a phrase in the book and there it is. They removed the preface, which was personalized. But the rest of the book, the table of contents onwards, is exactly a carbon copy of my book. And Amazon took a long time of back and forth. Eventually they said, sorry, there is no royalties. We can pay you for those because not a single copy was sold. And I have to accept their explanation for that. But what happens with Kindle? Yes, Kindle, the format for Kindle can be converted to EPUB and PDF easily. And within two days, me offering the book for free, because that was another feature that they have, is you can give it for free for a maximum of five days. So I think I opened it for three days, and hundreds were downloaded, and two people individually uploaded PDF copies to the torrents. So who knows how many readers are lost because, and it's still there today. I can, not just in the torrent, but I found it in a PDF archive somewhere. I don't know where that country that is, but it's there. So to go, to go back to my original question, what was your motivation for wanting to write a book in the first place? It was out of frustration that large companies do not recognize the value of SEO. So they bury it deep down in the hierarchy. And once they've created a position, they don't want to hear anything about it other than just seeing some numbers in there reporting that we had more customers through SEO or we had more traffic. But beyond that, they don't want to understand that an SEO cannot operate in a dark room somewhere. <clears throat> if you chuck some bits of paper over the wall, they need to be fully involved with what's happening at high levels. So I saw that too many times, and I worked with managers with no SEO background. 
therefore I wanted my book to be read by one of those managers. I don't care how many, but as long as a few of them picked up my book, actually understood it, and then they worked better with their agencies or with their own staff. So I'm not even suggesting that it has to be in-house. I've written a chapter on how to work with agencies, how to work with consultants, how to select them and so on, simply because the people who can make a change are not interested in SEO. And it, it was so bad that initially all of this was one manuscript. And my first literary agent who whom I approached and who rejected me saying, this is too niche, it won't sell in big numbers, but I'll give you this advice that it needs to be broken down because someone in the C-suite is not going to touch the book if it has SEO on the cover. So I said, okay, I'll put certain topics in book three, some in book two, and some in book one. And book three's title doesn't mention the word SEO on the cover. Now, the problem I'm left with today is I've got fragments of books two and three that I'm now trying to sculpt into a complete book in some logical sense, because remember that this was carved out of a combined manuscript in some logical order. That's why it's taken time to get them out. Now, again, I don't know whether they will sell even as well as book one did, but that's the whole point. That it opens doors, it allows me to stand up at conferences, and hopefully when all three are ready, that's when I'll really start promoting them. Yeah, because so I, I, I remember way back in, in the day, so again, I've got a lot of friends that have written books, and I, a friend of mine, Jim Cookrell, he wrote a book, and he, I remember him exp telling a story. He basically said he wanted to, he basically wrote this book, and he wanted to get basically become a keynote speaker. And quite often, the keynote speakers at conferences are usually there because they've got books to, to promote. And usually the deal that they'll do with the event organizer is they will speak on stage without a fee in return for the event organizer buying a thousand copies of the book. So therefore you've got a thousand sales right out the gates just for turning up and, and delivering a presentation. But what he found was there's a lot of people that kind of said, uh, uh, he, he then started to help other people. So he wrote a book and then he started to help other people to write their books. And what he did was he established that as, if somebody has a good title for the book and a good thumbnail for the book, as in image that goes on the cover, a lot of people will get a keynote on the basis of just that, right? On a good title and a good image, right? And a good story of what the book's about. Most people have got the ideas of a book in their head, all right? In the same way that I had the idea for this podcast in my head from having drinks with Rob Snell in, in Vegas after a pubcon had finished, right? He planted the seed of bad decisions with Jim Banks because I was telling these stories about all these things that had gone wrong. And he said, you should have your own TV program, right? And I didn't really think it would be feasible to have a TV program. So I figured a video podcast would be the next best thing. But the reality of it is this person who had just the title of a book and a cover ended up getting two keynote speeches on the back of just that. They'd not written even a single word in the book, never mind finish the book. And I think that sometimes is the challenge that, that a lot of people, when they're trying to go through the process of writing a book, they go through so much detail to get it out, right? And again, I think, as, as you say, the, the problem with non-fiction books is more often than not, by the time you write the end, probably... 30 to 50 percent depending on what your discipline in digital marketing is but certainly in ppc i always recommended that if i wrote a book on ppc by the time i wrote the end of the book that at least 50 percent of the book would be out of date and inaccurate right and i don't want to put an inaccurate book in the hands of anyone right because they're going to be making decisions on data that is not correct at the time of now right so really that's probably why having a website is going to be more beneficial than having that and again why, why i probably went down the route of having a podcast because then that way we can talk about topics that are relevant at the time that the episode is made right and people can see they can see the timestamp of this episode was shot on certain, this date so the the kind of information was relevant at that particular point in time and may well be superseded again seo has moved on a lot ppc has moved on a lot prs moved on digital prs moved on a lot and it will continue to move on there's no there's nothing but evolution that's the nature of digital marketing as a whole, really. You made an excellent point there, which um, which I should mention that my book does not contain how to do SEO at all. It's all about why do you do SEO? Why is it important? And that's all a manager needs to know. Their staff know how to do it. Or there are other books, like you said, that the how-to books change every day. We're seeing Google changing in a big way this last month, for example. Many old techniques have suddenly been swept away, whereas I've made sure that my book will not compete against any of those how-to books. So it's really what is SEO and why is it important? 
and, and, and the thing is, there's, there's going to be a link in the show notes to Ash's book. And, and if you want to go and get a copy and boost the, the sales numbers, absolutely go ahead and, and do that. It'd be, that'd be fantastic to uh, reward Ash for, for giving us his time today. I, I think that the challenge is that also with the onset of AI, right? Again, people are writing like massive novels just by using AI, right? Here's the synopsis of what the book's about. Write me a 400 word or 400 page book on this particular topic. And they go and make a coffee and by the time they come back, the book's written. And then they can just go in and make a few tweaks to, the, to it themselves, right? And people like yourself who've put in a huge amount of blood, sweat and tears over a career spanning 20 odd years. In some respects, you, don't, you, you haven't got a chance to compete against the people that are creating the books that have been written by AI, right? Because again, it's just, unfortunately, that's, it's almost like it's the publishing side of it is one aspect. The promotion side is the other. And again, there's a lot of people that are quite good at promoting things using Instagram and things like that to, to actually help promote something. And again, I've always, it's been bothering me a lot about how much, how many people are selling information products. So they're basically just selling information and it's not new information. It's not, I think Dixon called me out the other day by basically saying chat GPT is new. And I probably have to accept that yes, chat GPT is new. Everything else is the same. It's the same as it's always been. It's the same as it always was, right? Marketing will always be marketing. The principles of marketing will always, always be the principles of marketing, right? The kind of the terminology and methodology may change a little bit, right? But ultimately the, the fundamentals will not change at all. And, and unfortunately, so many people are putting a spin on the same information and selling it as an information product. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to sell people a dream of, well, you too can have a lifestyle like me if you implement what I do in this course that I'm selling for $397. And, and their motivation for selling it is just to make money, whereas your motivation for doing it is to help people who uh, do SEO or don't do SEO to do it and do it in a better way. No, that's absolutely correct. So thank you for having me. So Ash, it's been fantastic uh, to have you on the show today. So again, I, I again, we could we, we probably could and I probably would have talked for hours if, if we carried on, but I know it's quite late where you are and I'm going to leave you to go and um, have a good night's sleep. And I really can't uh, thank you enough for coming on as a guest. Appreciate you giving up the time to share your story and where you are now. And as I mentioned, Ash's uh, book will be linked in the show notes. Make sure you go and uh, re read about the book. Uh, it's got a forward forward by uh, Brett Tabke, who's one of our kind of mutual friends, good friend of ours. He was the guy who founded PubCon. He's probably one of the guys that if you did a straw poll, he's the one person that everyone in the industry can say thank you to for having the foresight to set up Webmaster World and then PubCon kind of spinning off from that. Yeah. And again, I've got so much to thank him for my kind of 25 years in the industry and i'm sure you're the same you've got a lot to, uh, to thank brett for for what he's done so to get him to be able to write you forward just speaks volumes about you as a person and yeah hope, hopefully at some point in time ash we'll get the opportunity to maybe have a follow-up and maybe we'll do it face to face when we're at pubcon in the future or a live event somewhere and maybe if you're promoting your three books we'll have you on to, to come back and talk to us about what's happened from where you are now to that point but yeah take some time spend some time with your grandkids go and enjoy that and um so we'll see you on the next episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. Thanks for listening in. Thanks, Jim. Thanks to the viewers.